morning. And welcome. I am shocked of the amount of people are here. I know everybody didn't come here to see me. It's it was probably because it's hot outside, right? Um, it's either that or because we have an extraordinary speaker today. Would all rise, please, on uh, and colors. Present colors.
Well, the reason that we are here today is to uh, commemorate Memorial Day. Um, a gentleman emailed me this the other day, and did you know that John Doe died of a gunshot fighting the British during the siege of Fort Shooter next to the Mohawk River in New York in the War of Independence, plus 4,434 others. John Doe, captured by Barbary pirates off Libya and was executed in Tripoli prison after a year of imprisonment prior to being sold into slavery during the First Barbary War in 1802, plus 33 others. John Doe, was killed by flying debris when the USS Lawrence was destroyed by British cannons in the Battle of Lake Erie in 1813, plus 2,259 others. John Doe was the first to die in the Battle of San Juanito against Santa Ana's forces in the war with Mexico in 1836, plus 13,282 other John Doe's killed by a rebel sharpshooter at Gettysburg while attempting to preserve the Union in 1865, plus 828,000 others. John Doe was killed by Yankee cavalrymen swords thrust at Manassas while fighting for his state's right, plus 864,000 other John Doe's killed by Sioux arrows while attached to Lieutenant Colonel Custer's 7th Cavalry in one of uh, over 40 Western Expedition Wars, plus 19,000 whites and 30,000 Native Americans. John Doe killed in an explosion aboard the USS Maine while, while he served, while he um, <coughs> tried up the Havana Harbor in Cuba in 1898, plus 2,445 others. Jane Doe died in a French church, which was shelled by German artillery, as she tended to the wounded in World War I, plus 116,515 others. John Doe killed when the USS Independent was sucked by a Japanese torpedo. Can't determine if his death was due to explosion drowning, or sharks. In World War II, plus 405,398 others. John Doe was killed in defense of Quezon <coughs> Reservoir in Korea against the Communist North and their Chinese allies, plus 54,245 others. John Doe, he was killed in his bunk in the truck bombing of the barracks by the Islamic Jihad in Beirut in 1983, plus 265 others. John Doe, he was killed on Operation Silver Bullet in the Battle of Le Grain during the early days of the war in Vietnam in 1964, plus 58,208 others. John Doe, killed during capture in Panama City Airport, Panama in 1989, plus 39 others. John Doe killed on a rescue mission in Grenada, in the West Indies, in 1983, plus 18 others. John Doe was killed in Baghdad, Iraq, during the Iraqi War in 1991, plus 1,564 others. John Doe killed on a rescue mission in Bosnia in 1997, plus 11 others. Jane Doe killed when her Humvee was struck by a roadside IED in Afghanistan in 2003, plus 2,356 others so far. John and Jane Doe killed during peacetime of the Cold War, plus 19,955 others killed in obscure, unremembered actions during the history of our country from 1945 to 1991. Now that's a total of 2,423,291 so far. This doesn't include the secret actions 
engaged in during the Cold War or other lives were lost. And never, never to be spoken of truthfully. <coughs> That's enough people to populate Houston, Texas, and Miami, Florida. Those names are John and Jane Doe's. Just names. But those two over two million people all had family, faces, and real names. We're gonna hear about one of the fifty-eight thousand two hundred and eight that died in Vietnam. Our guest speaker was in Vietnam. He was with one of the members from Fairfax that got killed in Vietnam, Donald Lebel. So with that, I'd like to introduce our guest speaker, Ray Clark. I started to say you might hold your applause until I finish, and then you might not want to. So I want to read a poem before I start today. It said, I watched the flag pass by one day, it fluttered in the breeze. A young soldier saluted it, and then stood at ease. I looked at him in uniform, so young, so tall, so proud. This daring young American who would stand out in any crowd. I thought of how many men like him had fallen through the years. How many died on foreign soil, how many mother's tears. How many pilots planes shot down, how many died at sea. How many foxholes were soldiers' graves? No, freedom is not free. I heard the sound of taps one night when everything was still. I listened to the bugler play and felt a sudden chill. I wondered, how, I wondered just how many times that taps had meant amen when a flag had draped the coffin of a brother or a friend. I thought of all the children, of the mothers and the wives, of fathers, sons, and husbands with interrupted lives. I thought about the graveyard at the bottom of the sea, of unmarked graves at Arlington. No, freedom is not free. It comes with a high cost, and this, this town has lost at least two in Vietnam. And today, uh, I want to talk about uh, how I was with Donald, or Donnie, or whatever you want to call him, um, when, when the time came for him to leave. And there were a lot of other Marines around Donnie that day. Um, I want to give you a little bit of a history thing. First, I want to talk about the band because the band is awesome today. And we thank them and just let's give them a call. <laughs> you know, and uh, the names he called out, I've read before, and I don't know the exact numbers, but the, I've read where all the wars of America, if they were put together, all the KIAs are dead. Except for uh, civil war, it would be around 800, 900,000 of them. That's what I've read. But if you took the civil war alone, they had almost as much as that. They had around almost 900,000 casualties in the civil war alone. How can that be? And the reason is because free men fighting for freedom. When you had two sides of free men fighting each other, they took a lot of casualties, a lot of people. So we sent free men to war. Um, they went. I'm sure Donnie joined the Marine Corps. He probably didn't get drafted in the Marine Corps. He was young. Uh, we were the same age. There was a lot of similarities with Donnie and I. And uh, I want to acknowledge his family, first of all, and, and thank them for coming. And uh, it's been kind of a dream of mine to meet you guys or at least communicate with you. Because I, want, I did want to speak for Donnie, and that's what I wanted to do. I also want to talk about my wife, my wife, Laura, over there, and sitting there with a the camera. Um, but anyway, she, uh, she's my friend, she's my, my love, she's everything to me, my caregiver, you, you name it, and um, she's been a wonderful wife. We wrote a book together, and um, it's about the wife of a post, uh, someone with post-trauma, but it's also about combat memoir. And everything in that book has to do with Donnie, because Donnie was there. I was there about a month before he was, so we spent that much time. I was in third squad, uh, first platoon, he was in second squad, but we all knew each other. And uh, I was a good friend of his squad leader because I became a squad leader and we became friends. And Donnie was always with him. And Donnie was his chief point man, that's what it was. 
So first of all, I'll tell you that Vietnam was a slip, a, a, like a slender country. If you look at it, it'd be like Florida more or less, but it wasn't a peninsula; it was a country. Um, and in the middle of it, they divided the UN divided that country because you had communists at the top and you had freedom fighters at the bottom. And so they devised a demilitarized zone, and it was a zone that was nobody was supposed to be in there, and nobody was fighting. They called it the DMZ, the demilitarized zone. It was four miles deep, and it ran the width of the country. And that was a great place for the enemy to take hiding in, because we couldn't go in there after them. And so the, the enemy utilized that area as a place to mount their forces in. From there, they would launch attacks into the south. Well, we operated on the first 15 miles of that DMZ. We actually went into the DMZ one time and kind of rushed back out, too, because it was a bad place. There were literally thousands and thousands of enemy soldiers in that area. I went to Kilo Company, 3rd Battalion, 3rd Regiment, 3rd Marine Division, and that's the one Donnie went to, and we both went to 1st Platoon. We were uh, United States Marines, we were grunts, um, we were in combat, um, and you, you think, well, if somebody does that kind of stuff, they got to be brave, but you know, I found out later in life, the people who seem to have the main, greatest amount of guts usually have the least amount of brains. Because you do stupid stuff like going to combat with people, you know. Uh, this is not paintball stuff. This is real stuff, you know. And we figured that out by the time we got there. <clears throat> so in Vietnam, uh, we were in that area, and that area it was so intense in that area that it received a name called the meat grinder. If you ever went a trip to go somewhere and it's called the meat grinder, don't go because it's a bad place. It was a bad place, and and parts of that place they had a name that the Marines would give it, and they'd say, that's a good place to die, because the enemy was so intense in this area. It was like being in enemy territory, and that's where we lived every day. So that was a part of the Vietnam we were in. The things I know about Donnie that you might not know about Donnie <coughs> is that Donnie was a, a point man. I knew he was a humble kid. I, he was 19 years old. I think of him as a kid, but I was 19 years old, too. I, I guess I was, a lot, I was six months older than he was, so uh, that made me a little, you know, but going into combat like that, we think you have to become such a, a Rambo kind of individual, but it's just a bunch of young men out there together. And I used to say it was almost like a, a hunting trip with some of your best friends, only the what you were hunting were actually hunting you. And it, that puts a little intensity into the area. <clears throat> um, the, the meat grinder was a particular area that you had to, you had to patrol it constantly. So the units in that area, I know 3rd Battalion, 3rd Regiment, 3rd Marine Division, we operated in that area, uh, and they were the, the battalion actually was here four years. We were only one year. But during that four years, we stayed in the bush, out there in the woods, jungles, hill country. 85 to 90 percent of the time, we were out there. And it got up to 118 degrees out there. There are no showers out there. I don't remember any more than three showers in Vietnam other than when I had malaria for about a week. I had took a couple of showers during then. But I can't remember taking a shower more than six times in Vietnam. Donnie was there too, and he said he had malaria, but he actually got wounded, you knew that, right? So he got wounded, but he wouldn't tell his family that kind of thing. And I didn't know that until his corpsman, our corpsman, told me. Because there was a guy named Jerry Herzog. He lived up in Pennsylvania, he's a good friend of mine. And Jerry and I always talked to each other, and he, he was telling me about Lebel, and he was talking about what a good kid he was, and, and how he just, he was kind of, not naive, he, he was wise in his years, I guess, but he, he was like a kid. Now, Doc Herzig was a few years older than Jerry, and Doc, uh, Jerry was telling me, he said, one time he was working with Donald, trying to do something for him, and there are a couple stories in my book, well, some of them are laughable, but, you know, I don't know, it was to us, I don't know about the Donnie, but anyway, I told the stories. But, but Jerry said, you know, he was telling me one time, he said, Doc, you're smart, man. You're going to be a doctor. You're going to do this. He said, I'm dumb, man. I'm here. I'm just going to be here, and I'm going to go back home. And he said, why are you here, man? And Jerry said it touched his heart, you know, and it's like, and they laughed together, and they got along together, and they were friends together. He had a lot of friends there. Uh, he was in second squad. When you pick a point man to, to walk point in a column, you might have 40 Marines and you got to have one first guy called the point man. Behind the point man, there's a shadow man that helps him walk the point. If he sees something and he takes the ground, the second guy has to open fire, and they call them shadow men. 
Well, Donnie was either a point man or a shadow man. Most of the time he was in Vietnam. I, would, I did the same thing. Uh, I worked with a guy named Grogan, and Grogan and I worked as a team, and we walked point a lot. It wasn't that I was brave, it wasn't that Donnie was brave. It was a, why would you do such a dumb thing of being first one in the uh, column? Because, you know, you're the first one going to be seen by the enemy or the first one that sees the enemy, and so it's always a very dangerous place. The North Vietnamese sometimes would make a very quick ambush, and they'd ambush you from the front. They always took out the first three to five men. So it was a dangerous position, but he had that kind of courage. Well, was it something else? Maybe it was love. Maybe he had a good family. And maybe he had a good hometown. Maybe he had some good friends. But in Vietnam, we had become a family there, and we watched out for each other. And so Donnie, would, he would walk point to like I walk point. And the question is, why did you do it? It had to be love. You loved your buddies. You loved life. You wanted them to live. I had a little bit of confidence in me more than the guys because, you know, some of these guys were having problems. My wife has one right now, matter of fact, with a thumb. <laughs> so anyway, a lot of family, a lot of family. Um, but you know, the reason you, you, you say that, and I, I tell people sometimes, I wrote a love story, and I said, when I say that, the women go, ah, oh, and the guy go, and they fill up in their mouth, you know, and they're like, I'm not reading a love story. But it is a love story because when you leave Fairfax, Minnesota, and you go into the Marine Corps, well, that's, that's love. You love your hometown. You love the little kids growing up. And if you don't do something to help them, they're not going to have the freedoms that everybody has. So it, it comes down to love. You join the military. You become a family in the military. Uh, they bind you together, blend you together. You're dressed alike. You've got the same haircut. It looks really, you know, bad sometimes. Uh, it looks like a bunch of twins walking around because we all got that. I remember a guy I wrote home from boot camp one time, and he was talking to his mom or writing to his mom, and he said, Mama, this is the worst day I've ever been in my life. How many veterans do we have here today? I mean, raise your hands. Let's all thank them. Do you mind? So we, all, we all did that. We all did that. Uh, we went to the military. They shaved our heads. They gave us some wrinkled uniforms. We looked like pickles walking around. It was a bad place. And this boy wrote home, he said, Mom, he said, oh, this is the worst place I've ever been in my life. He said, these people are mean to me. They holler at me. They scream at me. They talk ugly to me. Tell me, call me words I never heard of, Mama, and all this stuff. And he said, Mama, I can't tell you what it said about you. And so, <laughs> Mama's going to go tear somebody head. Yeah, that's what it was. So that was the world we joined, where they blended us together and created a family. And that family was our second family, and it became our first family for the time you were in the military. <laughs> And they had to do that to, to get us to even fight for each other or die for each other. And that's what they did. They created that family. So we became that family in, in Vietnam. And Donnie was a point man. He volunteered all the time. He did it very good. His squad leader was a friend of mine. He helped me become a squad leader. Or he trained me to be a squad leader. And uh, so we were in squad leader meetings all the time. I was around Donnie a lot of times and around a lot of guys. And, and I had certain men that I liked to use point. You know, you don't use a guy for point that just got a letter from your girlfriend, uh, Dear John or something, because he's like suicidal anyway. He's going to get everybody killed. You try to pick out the best ones, and that's what you use in enemy territory. We lived in enemy territory. I, I said in my book, I didn't realize how much walking point affected me nervous, in my nervous system because it's like an overabundance of fear. Because you got to have fear. Fear is clean. Fear is good if it's right the right way. Courage is not the absence of fear. Courage is, is doing things that you have to do in spite of your fear. You have to be a little bit braver than your greatest fear. <sighs> for a fireman to run into a house that's burning for a child inside that thing, <sighs> and he has to go in that place. He has to cast his own life aside. He has to dive to himself and go inside and, and help that child. Well, we did it every day in Vietnam. When you walk point or in the position, my buddy Grogan, actually, um, when I was in malaria, with malaria, my, my squad got ambushed, or the whole platoon did, really. And uh, anyway, Grogan was shot in the face. He lived, but it messed him up really bad. Um, and I would have been right there with him. I'd either been walking point or I'd been right behind him. And they, they took out the first three or five guys, whatever it was, I don't even remember now. Talk about it in the book. But it, it, it's, uh, it's a different life that we lived. 
on, when I talk in the book about me and the things that happened to me, I'm talking about Donnie and everybody else, really, because they were did the same exact things I did, and I didn't know every situation they walked in. I know some harrowing situations. You never know what's beyond the, the corner or the bushes or whatever it is. Jungle is very thick. There was triple canopy over us many times. You couldn't hardly see the sun in daylight. Uh, the enemy could hide anywhere within feet of you, and so it was a it was a bad situation. Most of our fighting was at 30 yards or so, and a lot of times it may be 30 feet depending on the jungle. So a lot of intense fighting that went on. On uh, September 12th, I was I was walking point position. See, I was squatting, and uh, and they're not supposed to walk point. But we got to a ridge line, and this was called Mudder's Ridge. It was named after some colonel or somebody. Most notorious place in Vietnam. That was one of those places that's a good place to die. That's what the Marines said to each other. We didn't want to go there. We didn't want to do this thing. We didn't like doing this thing. We didn't like living like this. It was what we were called to do, and we chose to do it, and we did it. So we got on that ridge line, and well, the, uh, the night before, they, you know, the, the lieutenant over us, uh, the gun commander, was telling us, and he told my squad we had to have point man. Well, the last time we went to that ridge, now, we were there three, this was the third time we'd been on that ridge line. It ran right along the DMZ border. And it was a river that actually bordered it. And so we know it's a bad place. We've been having small fights the whole time we're moving in this area. And um, the last time we were there, I had malaria. So I, I left for about a week or so, a week and a half. And during that time, the platoon got wiped out. Uh, or, not the platoon, but the squad got ambushed and we lost about half of it, really. Well, these guys before had been ambushed five days in a row. So my guys are a little bit leery of that, you know, and I, we have point that day. And so I told them, I said, I need point. And they were like, they back off, they hold their head down. And I said, no, no, I said, you don't want point. He said, man, I'm gonna get married, man, I'm gonna get married. And I said, you don't have a girlfriend. He said, I'm gonna get married though, man, I don't wanna do that. You know? <laughs> And they had been through those fights, and I didn't because I had malaria. So I said, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to walk point today, and then I'll hear nobody's mouth. I'll do it the first day. And they were like, that's good. That's good. That was like a baptism of fire. You know, that's one of the dumb things you do in life, you know, where you uh, you find out people that have the most guts usually have the least amount of brains because they do <laughs> stupid stuff. Well, I did that. I told the lieutenant about it. He said, that's up to you. He said, you can let somebody else get killed. You don't have to do it. I thought, you dirtbag. It's like, you know, it's like, that's you weren't a lieutenant, were you? <laughs> if you were, we love lieutenants, okay? Uh, so I talk, took point on it. On the way up this hill, it was a ridge line, it was hot, boy, 110 degrees probably. We took several heat casualties, and we got to the top, and we were going to we were gonna camp out on that, that ridge line. We were going to set, set up our perimeters and stuff. And there were, there were foxholes everywhere, fighting holes, what we call them. But the foxholes, and because there had been so many battles on that ridge line, they didn't, the Indian had been fighting for 50 years, Chinese, Japanese, French, Americans, and it was just a little battlefield we were walking in. We got to the top, we had to call choppers in, and uh, Lieutenant Colonel Oliver North was one of our second lieutenants. And he had somehow got some choppers to come in and they gave us a beer. They never give you anything but two beers, two Cokes, or a beer and a Coke. You can't even get drunk on two, Coke, two beers, you know, it's like, you had to suck it down and hope you got a little buzz out of it, and then you flush it down with some code or something. But that's where we lived. And there was a plane flying over. They sent a plane over there, and it was speaking in Vietnamese. It was an American plane. And they were telling the North Vietnamese, give up. The Marines are there to take you prisoner. I will give up. We thought, are you out of your mind, man? You're going to make trouble for us, what you're doing, because this is an army, man. This is one of the five army in the world. And they did not want to give up, you know, and you're, you're picking a fight. And we figured they're either going to give up or get mad. And they got mad at what they did. So at that afternoon, they told me to head down this ridge line because we were going to stay there that night. But I had to go down probably a half a mile or even more down that ridge line so we could get in position. And we had taken so much time getting these uh, casualties out that we were running behind. I hope I didn't leave that part of that napkin. Uh, but well, uh, you know, it, what it did, they told me you got to take a trail. We didn't like taking trails because trails are where you get ambushed. So I had to do it. And so we went down the trail. Later that afternoon, it was near five o'clock in the afternoon, I'm coming down that trail and they passed the word to me to stop. I'm the point man. So I stopped. Everybody stopped behind me. There's about 200 Marines in this column, 195. 
And so you think that's a big force, man, that's a lot of firepower. It is, and next you're outnumbered 20 to one or something, and it's not so much, but we were in enemy territory. So when I stopped, I had 80 pounds of gear on me, and I had my rifle at the ready and stuff. I was ready to shoot anything, any, any moment, and I hadn't seen nothing so far, and there was a trail in front of me, and my job was to watch that trail while everybody started digging in their fighting holes that night, cleaning them out so they could use them that night. The two Marines behind me came up beside me, and the three of us were standing there, and we're going to watch that trail. So you got 80 pounds of gear on you. So smart thing to do is just lean backwards and flop to the ground. So I put my rifle down like this, and I went to lean backwards just a little bit, and that pack is pulling me. And by the time I did, Cabasos on the other side of this, there was a Mucin, guy named Mucin beside him, me, and then there was Cabasos on the other side. Cabasos saw the enemy, about right 15, 20 feet in front of us. Down in the jungle, I couldn't see him. And so he opens fire, Brrr, machine gun, or you know, his full automatic, and it's blasting, and I, it startled me. And I looked at these two guys, and they're running back up the hill, shooting behind them. I'm going down, I can't go nowhere. And that pack is pulling me down. And I looked into where they're shooting, and there they are, 15, about 15 feet from me, was the enemy soldier, like from you and I. Uh, that's not very far. He's looking down the barrel of an AK-47, right in my head, too. And I'm going down, and I looked at him, and I, his buddy said something to him, because I saw him lean over like this. Everything is happening like slow motion. Why does that do that, man? I mean, why don't we can't get through things, bad things, or get in the car and you're like, whoa. And that's the way it was. And I looked at him, and that guy was looking at me. He was a young guy, I remember that, looking down that AK, and he went and blasted me full automatic from 15 feet away, and it blew me backwards. I landed on my pack, and I said in the book that the only thought came to me. I didn't know how to say that. This is the honest truth, I, I'll tell you today, and I, I will, I'll bear it until I'm dead. There was a voice that spoke to me on, when I hit on my pack, and that voice said, don't look at him, he'll shoot you again. And I followed directions, and I, I just went limp, rolled out of my pack, and I laid there about 20 minutes while they were shooting over top of me, the enemy, the Marines, the fighting, and, and I heard them hollering at each other, I heard, you know, Telling, giving orders, giving directions. The Marines were saying, we're surrounded, they're all around. I'm thinking, I'm gonna die. Now. And when I first laid there, I was laying like this, the enemy was behind me. I was laying on the ground. I couldn't move, I couldn't breathe, I couldn't, because they're gonna shoot me again. I know they're gonna shoot me again. My face is burning real bad. And I, I, I don't know if he shot me or not, but I can't, I can't do nothing. I have to keep my eyes closed, everything. And I'm laying there, and the first thing I wanted was God. I was like, God, help me. On the inside, you know, outside you're like this. Inside you're like, God, help me. And, you know, I was asking for God. And then I wanted my daddy. And my daddy was my closest friend. My mom had died when I was young. My dad finished raising myself and my little brother. And I wanted my daddy. And, and I was thinking if daddy was here, he'd come up and pick me up. You know, and anyway, about 15, 20 minutes passed by. Suddenly the enemy's gone into the jungle, They're, they disappear, the Marines come down where I am, and they were breaking a poncho out to roll me up in that poncho, because I was dead. And I got up, you know, and they were like, good Lord, man, where did he hit you? Where did he hit you? Oh, I don't know, man, my face was burnt from gunpowder, but it couldn't have final bullet holes in me. You know, it's like, how did he miss me, man? I picked up my helmet, two shots through my helmet, man, we got me. But uh, that was a close one. Made a really nice helmet. Everybody wanted my helmet, you know. So I'm taking my helmet. I had a bullet front and front and blew a hole out the back and one across the top of it. I found out later in life, I was talking to a pilot one day, years later, and I asked him, I told him that story about just what I just told you. And I said, I could never figure out why I wanted my daddy. I'm a 20 year old Marine now, man. I've been in combat for almost going on a year, heavy combat, and why do I want my daddy? And he said, you know, that's interesting. He said, we used to listen to the black boxes on down aircraft. You can hear the crew hollering, mommy, 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 when that thing's going down. So when you're dying, you really want somebody close to you, you know? You're reaching out for somebody. God first and then people. Somebody you love. And so that's the reason that I wanted my daddy there and there. This is the rest of that story. I'm gonna finish this and move on. When I came home the next year, my dad died from aneurysm quickly, so he was gone. That caps everything off, man. I lost my best friend on top of that. It was 12 years later, I was talking to one of my brothers who had worked with my dad in Newburgh, North Carolina, when I was in Vietnam. 
And he was telling me how dad worked him constantly, had his own business, and he had to be at dad's, business, uh, dad's work 5.30 in the morning to go to work, you know? And he said, every morning when I walked in that house, our dad was sitting there at a breakfast table eating breakfast. He was reading the Bible, he was doing devotions, and he was praying for me. My dad had been a hard alcoholic. The day he quit drinking, he drank a fifth and two pints of liquor. That's what my mom said, and he said. But he became a Christian, and he never drank again, and my mom never did either. So we became a normal family. Well, she's gone, and my dad's praying for me. When he told me that story, he said, 5.30 in the morning. Well, my mind went back to Vietnam because I was ambushed between 5 and 5.30 in the afternoon in Vietnam. So when I got home that day, I called an overseas operator, found out it was 12 hours difference between those two places. When I was being ambushed, my dad was praying for me, you know? And so God heard him, and God intervened, and I don't understand everything, but I, you know, it, it said some things to me anyway, the importance, and that's why I pray for my children constantly. I don't know why I'm in dying, why I live. I don't know. Maybe the Bible says the righteous are taken out of the way, and none consider for the evil to come. We don't know what's ahead of us, and God has wisdom, and God will do things. And so, if your loved one's gone, take take courage, and if, especially if you were praying for them, that God heard you, and God knew what was ahead. And so, God. He knows better than we know, and he knows what we can take. I know what I suffered when I came back home. Donnie would have suffered the same exact things, maybe even worse. I became an alcoholic for a long time. Uh, I did drugs, things like that. I was trying to suppress all the emotions and the feeling. I, I believe Donnie would have done the same thing, especially this next story I'm telling you because this is the day that, that my platoon got wiped out. Donnie was walking point. His buddy came over, to, his squad leader came over to me that morning, and he said, I want to see your helmet. So we're laying, laughing about the helmet and all this stuff. And then he says, uh, I said, uh, you got point? And he's like, yeah. I said, uh, who's, walking, who's walking point for you? He said, Le 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 Le. I said, that's good, man. We got a good one. Got a good one. He said, you keep your eyes open. Be careful on that hill. So we're going up that hill. About an hour later, we're up that hill. We got into a place where there was triple canopy over top of it. We couldn't see the sky hardly. And thick jungle all around us, and the, the, we're walking along, you know, 10 feet between each man, eyes wide open, looking at everything. Donnie was a good point man. He was one of the best point men we had. I'm not just saying that. That was the truth. But they had made it all the way through that ambush, and near the middle or end of it, Donnie spotted a claymore mine in the trees. And in that claymore, what they do, they take a directional mine, and they put all kind of mess in that stuff and glass and nails and anything they could find. And it would blow like this. The enemy was across the trail from us. They had dug trenches to lay in, so they wouldn't get hit by their own shrapnel. And then they rise up and, so we, the column is moving and then all of a sudden it stops. I'm like, uh-oh, what's this, what's this going? So everybody gets down on one knee and we look in both sides and they're turning one guy this way, one guy that way, make sure they don't walk up on us. And all of a sudden, whoa. Mines are going off, the automatic weapons going off, everything's going off. Now see, Army, Marines, everybody is infantry. You dress for battle in the morning. You, you have your flak jacket on, you have put the bandoliers across, you put a can, canteen of water in your pocket. You do everything you need to do because we had these big packs on. As soon as that happened, you dump your pack and you go to fight. The Marine Corps, and I'm sure the Army does the same thing. When the enemy attacks, the only solution you have is to attack the enemy. You gotta stop him, because he'll kill every one of you if you don't. And that's what we did. Everybody dumped their packs and took off to the front. I've never seen so many dead and dying Marines look like around me. Uh, guys were crabbing each other, guys were crawling, guys was getting out of there. Everybody had been hit. They took out uh, two squads of CP and part of my squad in that initial ambush. What had happened, Donnie had got through there, and they, it was a, these guys had been fighting for 50 years. They knew how to set an ambush better than we knew. And they, it was a perfect ambush, perfect place. Everything was set up, we found out later. When we got through there, uh, Donnie didn't detect anything until he got almost through the thing. And um, then he saw that claymore. So he calls, he stops, he gets down, everybody gets down. And then they called for a squad leader. He comes up there, Bill Bushy. And Bill was like, what is it? He said, we're in an ambush, man. So Bill's like, oh, what are we doing? The only thing you can do is hit the deck man, and start returning fire or whatever. But Bill was coming back to his squad. There was about 10, 10 feet between each man. And he's going down to tell the guys, ambush, 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 ambush. And everybody's getting ready, everybody's getting ready. 
And the enemy must have thought they were losing the element of surprise. And so they launched the ambush, boom. And that's when everything happened. Donnie was up in the front. Donnie was wounded. They, they shot Donnie in the stomach area. And so he fell down and he was laying there and he couldn't move. I don't know if it might have hit his spine. I don't know what it had done, but Donnie couldn't move. And so Donnie began hollering for us. And we're fighting a couple, couple hours, getting our guys out of there and then returning fire. Because we ain't going to leave Donnie. Donnie's our man. And we're going after Donnie. Well, I don't care how many we lose, we're going to get Donnie out. And he hollered, help me. I can't move. Come get me. And so we were fighting constantly. We lost more guys up there, dead and wounded. One guy up ahead of me, about five, ten feet from me, I, I saw him get shot eight or uh, five times in the upper chest and neck. You can see the bullets striking him, boom, 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 boom. And he turned toward us, and there was a corner behind me. We were all laying on our stomachs because the enemy was shooting about that high off the ground. And anybody that rose up got hit. Perfect ambush, perfect, perfect. They could either let you lay there, and see, they were using Donnie to get us because Donnie couldn't move, and, and so they, they were doing this thing. And so they knew we were going to come get him. We are going to get him. But it, we were fighting hard to get out of that place. That boy that got shot multiple times in the chest and all, we, I saw him fall backwards and he looked at us, and me and that corpsman and the other Marines laying there, and he said, I'm hit. And we're like, yeah. So the corpsman, he's like, come. And so the guy starts crawling, and Doc Sickles grabbed the guy, and flipped him over on his back, and the guy was kicking and wailing, and all this mess. And I didn't put this one part in the book, but this is true. Doc was holding down with his left arm on top of him because the guy was just, he, I guess he was drowning in his own blood. But Corman, he, he opened that satchel and he pulled out a tracheotomy kit and he, he couldn't find his scalpel to open up his throat. So he grabbed a pair of scissors and cut the guy's throat with a pair of scissors and did a track kit on him. You know, I found out years later that boy lived because of that Corman's actions. He lived and he came back home. I saw the medical reports on him. You do what you gotta do in bad situations, you know? And this is a bad situation. Well, during this time, once in a while, we'd hear Donnie say, help me, come get me. And so, we're trying, we're trying. And I had this young Hispanic kid crawl up behind me. He just turned, he was 17 years old in Vietnam. Anybody 17? Anybody yet? How old, 16? Okay, look, they're pretty much 17. <laughs> That's a young people, let me tell you something, man. I had a 17 year old, he just turned 18 a couple weeks before. He crawled behind me and he heard Donnie. And we're all brothers, man, we're fighting for each other. And he hit my leg and I said, what? And his name was Bob DeRuz and uh, he lives in uh, Fort, Fort Worth, Texas. Uh, we many, many times we've been together. But he hit my leg and I said, what? And he said, we gotta get him, man, we gotta get him. I said, we're gonna get him, just hold on, we're gonna hold on. And I saw him look away like that and he said, somebody gotta go get him. I said, you wait. And so I turned this way and I'm telling these guys, move it up, move it up, go out. So we're pouring back on them, putting ammunition, and they're throwing grenades at us and everything in the world. And so we're trying to make it forward. I look back and Bob's gone. And I don't have time to think about it. I don't know where he went. I don't know, it might have been 45 minutes or an hour later, we heard somebody in the jungle say, don't shoot, it's me. Bob got done and he turned him back. They were coming through the jungle, dragging, dragging. Don was alive, everything. The corner went and working on Don. We had to get him out of here because he's the last one we had that wasn't dead or wounded, and so we had to drag him out. We got him back to the next hill. It was this was the worst day of our lives. I'm serious, man. And uh, we got him back to the next hill, and they put the corpsmen up. They put the uh, medevacs in a certain area so the helicopters could come in. We got around them and we were setting up holes because we know they're going to attack us. They're going to come out and finish that ambush on us. We didn't know it right then. There was five or six hundred of them. There was only 48 of us who went down here. By the end of the day, there's only six of us left that weren't dead or wounded. Most of these guys were wounded. They butchered us. They also knew from previous battles before we ever got there where we we're going to come from, where we we're going to set up our perimeters at where the men of Axe were going to be. They knew another platoon would come to help us out, so they ambushed the platoon that was coming over to help us out. They ambushed them, and they started mortaring us. Donnie was laying out with the men of Axe, and Doc Sickles was working on Donnie, trying to stop the bleeding, trying to help him. 
and mortar starts coming in on top of us. I had one landed about a yard outside of my hole. Everybody thought it went in my hole, but it didn't, thank the Lord. Boom, and they hit, you could hear them coming down. You could count them, when they fired them, they'd go bloop, 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 bloop. And you'd say, there's five coming in, and you hear them coming down, and they made a swooshing sound. Boom, all of it. And it was constantly, for like four hours of that mortar, that mortar attack. See, from previous battles, your enemy sets up for you, and they know everything you're going to do, and from, they study these things. We do the same things. And so, in that mortar attack, a mortar landed next to Donnie and Doc Sickles, and they both were killed. Well, not only them, but they were other Marines being wounded, and, and just, I mean, it was a bad deal. Donnie was with his friends. Donnie was having them all around him. Um, it was a bad day for us. Never lost so many friends in my life, dead and wounded. I never saw most of them again. They were gone. And by the end of the day, I had I was a, I was a senior man in my squad, I, or in my platoon. I was a lance corporal, and I was a um, I was a squad leader. And so, by the end of the day, there's there's six of us all total. I had five guys in my squad, and that's the way the day ended. And it was like you're shaking your head and you're thinking, what happened to this thing? I can tell you about the life of men. Bill Bushy, the squad leader for Donnie, he died that day too. He had three days left. His family, there was a wedding set up for Donnie, or for, um, for Bill. I knew all about it because I knew, I knew Bill. We used to eat his sister's cookies and stuff together, chocolate chip cookies. That was a highlight of a day sometime. And he had three days left. They had a wedding set up for him and everything. All he had to do was show up. He didn't show up. <coughs> He was one of my best friends. He was the kind of guy that everybody thought Bill was their best friend. You ever had a friend like that? Just outgoing, he was just going back to college, going to have a good life. It broke our hearts today we lost our friends. I'm telling you, you, you it broke your hearts too. I know that, I knew it, because I knew Donnie. But it broke my heart too, uh, I'll be honest with you. And other Marines too that knew him. I've, I've suffered over that thing for 49 years. Him and Bill and Stephen Rickerson and um, Jerry Gatlin and Doc Sickles and there were two others. One guy was named Ham. Ham died 27 years after the ambush from the injuries he got the day of the ambush. That's what the VA told me. We thought he had a head wound. That's that's the last we saw of him. He was a kid from Alabama. 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 Um, you know, when I came here, I thought this is looks like home to us. Uh, we live in a, not, not quite a small town like this, but trees, everything, woods, everything. That's where we live in North Carolina. I thought the biggest difference in, from here in North Carolina is the language. Because up north, you call a guy William Robert, and down south, we call it, or Robert William, and down south, we call him Billy Bob. You know, same guy, same guy. We just changed the name a little bit. <laughs> but I can understand your pain, and I agree with you. I came home the end of that year. Uh, I was in more combat later in another unit. They split us up and sent us into another unit, uh, pulled that unit out of Vietnam, and so we went down there and we spent another three, or, well, I was two months, I guess it was, and then I came home. By the time I came home, I was numb for the neck of Donnie would have been the same way. Because of what we saw, we experienced, loss of friends. I'm gonna tell you something, if, if, Bill, if Donnie had lived, if Bill had been killed, he never got over that, I'm telling you. Maybe God knew that. Maybe God understood that. See, I got into alcohol and drugs. I was trying to suppress my anger and my grief. I wanted to be with these guys. I loved those guys. I came back home. They're like, well, I don't want to eat that because I don't know who fixed it. I'm like, eat the mess, you know? We ate sea ration made 25 years earlier, you know? It's like, Eat the junk, and that's the way we live. And everybody's like, oh, no, no, I gotta have a shower three times a day. It's like, man, I didn't get three showers in Vietnam, you know? And so we came back home with a different attitude, a different, and you don't hear this story a lot in Vietnam. I mean, living in the jungles like this, but that's the world we lived in. God's wisdom is better than our wisdom. I drank for 10 years. I drank and I did some drugs, as a matter of fact. And all I was going to do was not hurt no more. I'd, I'd wake up in the middle of the night in that ambush, and my eyes would be stuck together. I'd have to wash my eyes. 
And every night, that's, it seemed like every night, probably several times a week, I dreamed of that ambush. Every night, it seemed like. And I'd wake up, I couldn't tell nobody, I, nobody wanted to listen to it. I was married to another woman at that time. Instead of Laura, we've been married 33 years. Uh, my first wife, I married her. I, went, I was at a bar, met her when I first came back home. I hadn't been with a woman, around a woman, for over a year. And she's probably soft and pretty and smells good. And it's like, hey, that's good, you know? So, um, dated her about three months. And then, uh, kind of, you know, I was living sorry. She was just as sorry, probably. But she wanted to get married, so we got married. And the night I was going to get married, my dad hadn't died then. So my dad, I was living with my dad. We got out of the Marine Corps. And my dad came in the bathroom and said, Ray, you going to marry that girl? I said, I guess so. He said, do you love her? I said, no. He said, why are you going to marry her, boy? I said, I just want to be normal. I want to feel normal again. Yeah. So I did. We may stay married about 11 years or so. I uh, had two little boys. Uh, they're my friends today, both of my sons. Um, but I was dying on the inside and trying to live on the outside, you know, and could not get over that grief and stuff. I'd go back to bed at night when I, when I had that and I would try to lay there and redo that ambush to make sure nobody died. But when I'd wake up, it'd be the same thing. I, I was living in a hell, I'm telling you. And I drank for 10 years. I was in a bar 10 years later. I came in there one night and I got a beer and I was sitting down at the bar. Usually I was shooting pool or doing something. And I got looking around all the people. And I was, I was drinking with all the time. And we came from all these rotten lives into a bar where we partied together. We go back to our rotten lives again. And so we were in there. And I, I was drinking a beer, and I got looking around all the people I was always hanging around. And I thought, I serve my country. I've suffered every day of my life for this mess. These guys love camouflage, but they don't. They don't want to shoot. They don't want to be in the military. They, they, it's like that's dangerous stuff. And um, and I got looking, and I thought, what am I doing? I don't even like these people. You know, here I am hanging out, I'm losing my wife, my children, my family, my home, everything I love, my, my business or my job for this. I put my beard down and I said, I'm done. I ain't doing this no more. I'm gonna go home and take care of them for a while. So I went home and I never drank. It's been 38 years ago since I made that conscious decision. I'm gonna start taking care of me from now on. It wasn't helping me. You know, it's taken a lot of money from me. I got a couple of big dopey eyes over the years and all this stuff and that was expensive. And so I started making better choices. Uh, it, it was a couple months later. Uh, I'm not going to get religious. I am a chaplain, so be careful now. Uh, but a couple, a couple months later, I had thought I'd come in drunk sometimes, and I'd go to my boys' bedrooms. They were little kids. And I'd pray, and I'd say, God, I know I'm going to hell, and I deserve it, Lord. I've done so much rotten mess in my life. I've hurt so many people. But God, please, don't let my babies go to hell. And that's the way I used to pray. I'd go in this one bedroom, and I'd go in his other bedroom. I didn't do my wife like that, because she could take care of herself, kind of thing, man. Not her, but y'all. <laughs> but uh, anyway, I, my brother invited me to go to church with him. It's like, whatever. Uh, and I, I, I don't know where I got the courage from, but I thought, okay. See, I thought God had, God, I had something worked out. I figured I was going to go to hell because I deserved it. He was okay with it, because he never told me nothing. You know, he never said, don't do that. Or, so I, I was thinking that. Well, he invited me to church that night, and I went in that church, and I was there, and I put up with everything. I didn't know what the guy said or nothing else, but they clap, I clap, you know, they stand up, I stand up. I was just like a monkey in there doing thing. I had no intention of doing nothing but getting back out of that place. I was going to show that night, I was going to show God and all these people, I wasn't scared of them. And that's why I was there, point man, you know, Marine, right? <laughs> Dumb as a cop, man, I ain't lying. So, I, I, I was in there, and I was getting ready to walk out, and they had me hemmed in by people in this pew, and I was going to get out of there, but I couldn't find a way to get out and not look stupid trying to over pews or something. And I saw this little woman, I'd only met her one time, and she was like these Jesus, 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 Jesus people, and she come whittling in that crowd around these people toward me, and I thought, good Lord, man, I don't, I don't want to hear what you got to say, you know? So she walked up to me, and she hugged me, and gave me a little hug, and she said, I love you, Ray. I said, I love you too, and I was lying, man. I didn't like the woman, man, so I didn't want to get rid of her, you know. And that woman started to walk away, and she turned around and stuck her finger right in my face. And it was like, and she said, don't turn your back on him tonight. And it pierced my heart, man. It's like, 
I've been running from God for a long time, man. I had so much junk in my life and mess, and it just pierced my heart. And I said, I can't. I can't. She thought, man, I can't do it. I meant, I can't run no more, man. And that night I ran to God, and I asked His forgiveness, and God lifted that burden, that guilt off of me, that grief off of me, and I was able to live from that on. And from that point on, I likened it to walking with one of my grandchildren, where I got his hand, and he got my hand. Because people say, well, God's holding my hand every day, but are you holding his hand? That's the idea. And when that child, if you got hands like that, holding each other, and you trip or stumble, you never fall, because he's got you. You might dangle. I do a lot of dangling, but he, you know, he always keeps me from falling. And if I get so bad off, he'll pick me up and carry me. And then you become an extension of his hand. <sighs> That's why I came today. I want to tell you, I love Donnie. Donnie was a friend of mine, and it grieved my heart, and it grieved my heart today. I love you. I, I, it's such you don't know what it does to me to meet his family today. He was a good man. He was a man beyond his years. He was a man of courage, and he died among his friends. And I believe Donnie did the same thing in that that day. He, I know he's Roman Catholic. He was in this uh, in this town. Huh? He knew about God, and I know that he was probably calling on God that day. So take solace in the fact that you had a wonderful brother. Honor this guy, all you high school students. Remember the, the, the sacrifices he made so you can live free. You say, well, it's just one man. Well, a lot of men, right? I mean, you put them all together. They preserved this country. God used them. I want to leave you one little story when we finished. Um, they said during the Civil War there was a battle being fought one day. And this is for all the veterans sitting here. I don't know where you've been. I know every battle is different. Every battlefield is different. You're carrying burdens and I'm not carrying. I'm carrying burdens you're not carrying. Everybody in this place, you've got burdens. Um, but the idea is don't give up. During the Civil War, there was a battle being fought one day. And one side began taking a lot of casualties. So the general of that army wrote up to a young teenage bugler. The boy was just a teenager, 15 years old or so. He'd never been in combat before. He'd only been in the army for about a month. He was a bugler. He was learning music. He was trying to get things going. And the general shouted to him, sound retreat, we've got to pull back. And the boys just looked at him like a deer in the headlights. He, he totally traumatized. And the general shouted again, I said sound retreat, my men are being cut down like grass. And the boy said, sir, I can't do it. And the general, he's standing with a bugle, and the general jumped off his horse, he ran him and grabbed the kid, and he grabbed him and shook him and slapped him hard, and he said, I said, Santa retreat, my men are dying out here. And the boy said, sir, I can't do it. And the general said, why not? He said, well, why can't you sound retreat? And the boy said, sir, I've never been taught how. He'd never learned that song. He'd only learned one song while he's been there a whole month, and that was charged, and he was retreating. So the general said, do something, boy, we're dying. So the boy, uh, the general jumped on the horse, he rode back into the battle. The boy stood there for a minute, he wanted to run because he was scared to death. But he put it to his lips and the only song he knew, he began playing charge in the middle of a retreat. Well, come to find out, the men on the front lines fighting heard him and thought reinforcements had come. So they began taking courage and fight like wild men. The enemy heard the boy play in charge, and they thought their reinforcements, the other reinforcements had arrived, so great fear fell on them, and some of them began to cut and run, because they just knew they were going to get a run out. The men lay down in the field, wounded, hurt, didn't want to fight anymore, some worse than others. Probably everybody in this place has been hurt somewhere in your life, you've been wounded, and you don't want to fight no more. You know, you avoid battles sometimes, because I'm just sick of fighting. And they were laying there, and they heard that boy sound in charge, and they thought the reinforcements had arrived, so those who could got up, took their weapons, and rejoined the fight. The ones who were out in the field hiding because they were scared to death of dying, they heard the boy play in charge. They thought reinforcements had arrived, so they became more afraid of being caught by their own troops than dying, so they took their weapons and rejoined the battle. The battle turned that day, and they won because that boy had never learned the song retreat. I like to just sound that the sound of retreat or sound of charge to you today. Don't give up, man. This is We're all in a battle of sorts. Don't give up. Call on God. Love your family. Do what's right. Make better choices. Uh, I have a program at Camp, uh, I do at Camp Lejeune, the Combat Marines coming back from Afghanistan, Iraq, and all over the world. 
and it's called Life After Trauma, A Pathway to Purpose. It gets them up, gets them moving back into life, and one called Moral Injury, where your, your conscience has been hurt. We've got a lot of value. These old soldiers and Marines and sailors and airmen, we're trying to teach another generation. We're trying to teach these kids over here values and stand up for what is right. I'm glad to be an American. I know you are. I'm so happy to be in Fairfax. I, I don't know. I hope I didn't hurt you in any way today, but I love your brother. I love those other guys, and uh, I thank you for allowing us to come. I, I really appreciate it. Thank you.
Would everybody please rise? Turn it over to the pastor. <laughs> Let us close in prayer. If I can't hold it together, I apologize ahead. Father, in closing this morning, we honor our veterans who gave their best when they were called upon to serve and protect their country. Continue to bless them, Lord, for their unselfish service to preserve our freedoms and our safety. Bless them for the hardships they faced and the sacrifices they made for us and their country. Help them help us to show them our respect our thanks and our honor. Watch over them and bless them with your peace and happiness. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Tired of colors.
very inspiring speech. His speech, you will not find in any history books, but you will find it in his books back in the back. So if you'd like, he has some books it, are there for purchase if you'd like to see that. Thank you to the GFW band as normal. You did an awesome job. I'd also like to thank Tom Blumaster, because it wasn't me for him. Ray wouldn't have been here. Raise your hand, Tom. I'd also like to thank the volunteers that helped put up the flags and the students that helped set up the auditorium. With a community like this, it makes the program go a lot smoother. Thank you for the volunteers. Thank you so much. 